I'm going to go through the remaining portion uh, of page 23 all the way until around 29, uh, which we left off yesterday. You have already done activity 4, which allows you to look at the four factors uh, which we need to consider for nucleophilic substitution. So, um, first of all, is the nature of the substituent, or we call it the substrate effect. Okay. This is followed by the nature of the nucleophile, good or strong nucleophile. And you, you learn about the correlations, or whether there's a direct correlation between basicity and nucleophilicity. And the nature of the living group as well. If you have a living group that is stabilized, it will have a preference to leave. And of course, solvent effect, but solvent effect, take note, uh, it's not in your syllabus. Okay, so if I were to just scroll back all the way to the, to the first page, your syllabus document, right? It's written categorically that solvent effects are not required. Okay, so they, they wrote that in. So um, we have this in, basic, uh, largely just for enrichment and just to complete the curriculum because uh, if you go to a university course on nucleophilic substitution, organic chemistry 101, usually some effects will be introduced. Okay, so uh, you have gone through your H2 lectures by now. So uh, substituent effect, or we call it the substrate effect, I think you should be relatively familiar with. Yep, so as mentioned yesterday, um, tertiary halogenol alkanes, uh, because the rear is sterically hindered, so it's the least reactive in SN2. Okay, but uh, it tends to undergo SN1 because the carbocal is stabilized. Okay, so I won't be attempting to go through all these details uh, for you. So uh, I think uh, you can read them on your own. Okay, and um, another part of this is just to tell you over here that if you have a halogen that is directly bonded to an sp2 hybridized carbon, okay, uh, in the case of a vinyl chloride and in the case of chlorobenzene, you will realize that um, the lone pairs of electrons can partially delocalize into the pi electron cloud. So this actually strengthens the carbon chloro bond. So this strengthening right, will also ensure that um, your C cell bone will not break that readily. Okay, and of course, at the same time, the pi electron clouds uh, act as an uh, electron rich source which will repel away the incoming nucleophile. Okay, so uh, that's the usual kind of uh, narrative that is uh, painted by both your H2 and H3 nodes and some of the uh, materials which you have seen in uh, basic organic chemistry text. Okay, yeah, so um, over here, uh, it's something that you are relatively familiar with if you have gone through your H3 notes, but uh, I think in H3, we, we just want to uh, move on a little further uh, by explaining to you the origin of the stabilization of carbocation. Okay, so this is actually known as hyperconjugations. Okay, this is actually known as hyperconjugation. So we are actually looking at the fact that uh, the more number of the greater the number of R groups you have, the greater the probability of your CH bond okay being able to be facing the MTP orbital. So the greater this probability is uh, it allows some form of induced inductive effect. Okay. Um, what kind of effect is this? So basically your CH bond, right, because they face each other, right? So it will want to partially overlap. Okay, partially overlap. This is a very, very weak overlap, but a little bit is better than nothing. So this overlap actually stabilizes your carbocation in that sense. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the reason why uh, a tertiary carbocation is more stable than secondary, and then uh, secondary is more stable than primary. Because the greater the number of R groups you have, the greater the probability of this particular CH interaction Okay, with the MTP orbital uh, on your carbocation, nick carbon. Okay, yep. Um, I think this portion is on resonance stabilization, which uh, we have discussed quite a bit about it, so I don't think I will go into details. Okay, so I will leave you to read through the details. And then um, in the resonance structure exercise, we have also gone through the exercise in drawing resonance structures. 
Okay, and if you remember from my lecture, I did mention that benzyl chloride is an interesting example because for benzyl chloride, it is primary, okay, but there is a very strong tendency if you perform the kinetics experiment, okay, which allows you to undergo SN1. Why is that the case? Because the benzylic carbocation, this is known as the benzylic carbocation, is actually resonance stabilized. Okay, so your benzylic carbocation is resonance stabilized, so this allows uh, it to maybe undergo um, SN1 uh, as opposed to SN2. Okay, and taking note that your phenol group is a huge group, this phenol ring is very huge. So, uh, although it's only one group there, but it could potentially repel incoming nucleophile when it approached from the rear of the CCL point. Yeah, so uh, because of that, then maybe SN1 is favored. Okay, just take note of this. Nature of nucleophile, we have discussed in some details, so I don't think I want to uh, go through it again. Uh, you can just go through activity 4. Nature of the living group, we have also discussed in some detail. So for living group, they are resonance stabilized. Uh, they tend to leave. Okay, now um, this is one particular example. Uh, I think one of the students actually asked me yesterday. Yeah. So if you take a look at this particular example, you have OH- as a nucleophile. It performs a nucleophilic attack on the rear of the CBR bond and then uh, it forms methanol as a result. But do you think the reverse can happen? This is, actually, this is actually the reverse. Yeah. So the students was asking me, so how you know whether it can happen or cannot happen? Yeah. So in this case, um, there are a few ways you can look at it. I think number one, uh, OH- minus is actually a much stronger base as compared to bromide. So this makes it a poor living group. Okay. So if I have a poor nucleophile attacking the rear of the CO bond, with OH as a poor living group, this reaction is extremely unlikely to take place. However, if I have a strong nucleophile attacking the rear of the CBR bond over here, with bromide as a good living group, then the probability of this attack is a lot higher. Okay, so uh, that is why it is important for you to understand uh, the nature of the living group as well. Okay, and uh, this particular part is probably more important for you in H3 uh, as, com as uh, opposed to H2. But uh, maybe I, I want to stress to all of you that uh, if you are able to understand this, you could actually explain to your friends taking H2. Why is it that um, when you want to replace an OH group, you need to first protonate the, the oxygen. Okay, so remember from the front, OH is actually, OH minus is actually a poor living group. However, after I protonate the OH group, I'm going to form this OH2 plus and water will be expelled. So water is definitely a much better living group as compared to OH minus. Yep. So uh, with this coming into play, right, you will realize that in order for me to replace OH, I can't just whack the rear of the CO with BR. I have to first convert OH to OH2 plus to make it a good living group before the bromide can approach from the rear and then water leaves. Okay, so this is a, probably a, an important point you need to take note of. And toslate. Okay, toslate, we talked about it yesterday. Remember the structure which is re resin stabilized. Yep, it's also a very good living group. Solvent effects, we have done the debrief just now, earlier on, okay, in another in another video. So uh, if you wish to, you can read about it. So yep, solvent effects, not in your current syllabus, you can read about it if you want. Okay, um, SN1 or SN2, this is a common question that students ask. Uh, most of the time, students want a perfect answer. Like, can you just tell me, is it this or that? Okay, as I mentioned yesterday, there is no clear-cut answer, okay? It's not whether SM1 or SM2. It could be both. In fact, most of the time, it is both, okay? So, we'll take a quick look at exercise one. Um, so, do you think rock A is better or rock B? Okay, now, um, there is a reaction which you haven't learned, which is called elimination, okay? So, you notice that um, for rock A, I am performing nucleophilic attack onto a primary halogenol alkyl. 
Okay, so uh, there is no other possible side reaction which could take place. Okay, so definitely if uh, I'm given this particular scenario, route A is the preferred route. Okay, then you might be asking, hey, what is wrong with route B? I can also potentially perform a nuclear filler attack, right? I mean, uh, isn't this what you, you taught us yesterday? Uh, that is there any other possible reaction that can take place? Okay. Um, well, I mean, there is a competing reaction known as elimination, which I'm just going to discuss extremely briefly here. Yes, uh, SN2 could take place, but remember, the rear is sterically hindered. Okay, let's not forget that um, the rear over here is quite sterically hindered because it's a secondary iodo compound. Okay, so route B might be slower. And coupled with the fact that uh, potentially I'm going to get an elimination product. Why? Because methoxide is itself a strong base. It's a very strong base. So it can act as both a nucleophile and a base. Okay, which we're going to cover in the next uh, lecture. Okay, so um, whenever you have a nucleophile, you also need to take into consideration whether it could be a base as well. If it's a base, you're going to get elimination product, which complicates the whole matter. Remember yesterday I mentioned it's not only SN1 and SN2 complicating each other, but you could have elimination reaction, otherwise known as E1 or E2 competing with each other as well. Okay, so that will make the whole business uh, relatively difficult. Okay, um, we're going to rank the rates um, the, 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 the reaction in order of increasing rates, okay? So, uh, in, 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 in this case, uh, if you remember our nuclear felicity, uh, you remember that this is definitely the fastest because uh, sulfur is more polarizable as compared to oxygen, okay? So, definitely, um, reaction 2 will be the fastest. So, I'll rank this as 1. And then, um, between 2 and 3, how do I rank them? In terms of steric demand, okay, steric demand, um, I'm expecting this portion to be less directly hindered as compared to this portion because I have a, a huge uh, tertiary built out group. So definitely this will be rank two and then uh, three. Okay, so rank one is the fastest, rank three is the slowest. Okay, so um, the rank each of these. Uh, in order of increasing rates. Okay, so now we are looking at solvent effect as well. Okay, we need to look at um, solvent effects. So, uh, in terms of protic solvent, okay, in terms of protic solvent, definitely H2O is a uh, uh, better uh, protic solvent as compared to ethanol. Okay, so between 1 and 2, I would expect uh, 1 to be uh, better as compared to 2 because um, the water molecules, the water solvent is able to stabilize the carbon cation more. Okay, but in terms of leaving group, okay, for reaction three, it will definitely be the fastest. Okay, because remember, for first order nucleophilic substitution, the nature of the leaving group plays an important role because the substrate is captured in the red uh, equations. Okay, so definitely, I would expect three. In this case, this is three. Okay, to be the fastest. Okay, followed by one and then followed by two. All right.